as you see, the panel is very wide and rich, uh, so that I have the privilege to stand. Thank you uh, again, um, Your Holiness Pope Dr. Rufus uh, Ositello, the Primate and the Metropolitan Archbishop of the Church of the Lord Prayer Fellowship Worldwide, for visiting the World Council and also visiting the Ecumenical Center together with your senior colleagues and also with this opportunity to interact with you and with your colleagues, but also with our colleagues and also our, our good partners. We have something on the agenda about Nigeria very often in the World Council Churches. And as you have noticed, also generously remarked, we have paid a lot of attention as the World Council Churches to our churches and to the situation in Nigeria over the last years. Particularly last year when we had as a focal uh, uh, perspective in our pilgrimage of justice and peace the situation of our churches in Africa, we also had several events and meetings and visits to Nigeria. Among the many uh, initiatives we have had also over the last years is an interfaith uh, center for <coughs> addressing violence and human rights in Nigeria based in Kaduna as a result of a joint uh, Muslim Christian visit uh, to Nigeria in 2012. This is still a, an institute in, in uh, developing, in, in making, but it is one of the signs of the ongoing commitment uh, from the World Council Churches to work with you and your partners, both Christian and Muslim partners in Nigeria, for the human rights, for the peace, for the reconciliation, and to end the violence in your country. Particularly the violence that is somehow connected to the interreligious uh, differences and also the interreligious challenges. We have also, in addition to that, to say that uh, Nigeria is a very big country in your continent and in the world, and also a very strong religious country with strong churches, with strong and wide membership, and also a strong impact on the society in your country and in your continent of Africa. But we also see you as a strong partner in the worldwide fellowship. So we use this opportunity to invite for a discussion for sharing reflections, but also to share comments and reflections both ways about Christianity and human rights in a multi-faith Nigeria. This is an opportunity for all of us to learn more, but also to be involved and to see where are we going together from here. So I use this uh, as my words of introduction, and we now look forward to listen to you on this uh, theme Christianity and Human Rights in a Multi-Faith Nigeria. And after that, we will have responses from the panel. So please uh, take my place and share your presentation. Thank you. Maybe you could, uh, would you prefer to sit? Oh, okay, let me. People of God uh, also joined the General Secretary of the WCC to welcome every one of us to this session. I will not take too much of your time, but everything I'm going to talk about you can find in this book. Everything is documented in this book. It was just published last year. I want to start with introduction. The key words of this paper on Christianity and human rights in multi-faith Nigeria are Christianity, human rights, and multi-faith. Those are the three key words. Christianity, according to the Oxford Dictionary, is 
the religion based on the person and the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the, in the, in the dictionary, you not find our Lord. I'm the one that added that to it. Or his beliefs and practices. Human rights are the basic rights and freedoms that belong to every person in the world from birth until death. These basic rights are based on values like dignity, fairness, equality, respect, and independence. According to the United Nations, which is known to at least to us here at the WCC, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights include rights of marriage, family, right to own your own things, freedom of thought, freedom of expression, the right to public assembly, and much more. The rights that I have here, there's about 15 of them, social security, workers' rights, the right to play, food and shelter for all, the right to education, copyright, a fair and free world. Also, among this right, we also have responsibilities. And no one can take away your human rights at the bottom of it all. A multi-faith, according to Longman Dictionary, multi-faith may be defined as including or involving people from several different religious groups. So in the context of Nigeria, we are talking about Christianity and Islam. Even though multi-faith in Nigeria is much more than that, but people seem to forget the African traditional religion, ATR. So the, in Nigeria, actually, we have three major religious groups. There are much more than that, but three major ones, ATR, African traditional religion, Christianity, and Islam. The religious demography of Nigeria, the deletion of religion is one of the parameters in the 2006 national census, which denied the possibility of accurately stating how many Christians, Muslims, and ATR adherents are in Nigeria. In the wisdom of the Muslim elites, we discussed this in our own council, interreligious council. They didn't want, they want government, because government actually included re religion, affiliation, in the census paper. But the Muslims said they don't want it. It should be removed. And the government succumbed to it. And it was, because they said if it is not removed, they will make sure that the northern part Muslims of Nigeria do not take part in the census. The reason for this till today in our council, interreligious council, which comprises of 25 Christian leaders and 25 Muslim leaders, they have not been able to tell us. They only said, we asked them, they said they just don't want it. Okay, they use an excuse that it could be used as dividing instead of uniting, but we were not convinced. The reason is very simple. They love to, re to rely on the 1963 census when very few Christians were in the north. Between 1963 and now, there has been so much missionary work in the northern part of Nigeria. Still, Muslims are in the majority. There's no question about that. But there are a lot of Christians that are, you know, a lot of Muslims that have been converted. Not only Muslims, even ATR, African traditional religion, which you also have in the north, they have been con converted to Christianity. So the, uh, the suspicion is not a fact. The suspicion is that they don't want people to know the actual numbers of Christians in the north and the actual numbers of Muslims in the south. Because 30 years back, 
or even longer than that, there were more there are more Muslims in the South than we have today. Many Muslims in the South have also converted to Christianity. We went to school with Muslims together, even in the Southwest. And uh, many of my friends that we went to schools together, they are all now Christians. I don't even know of a single one that remained a Muslim. Most of them turned to become Christians in the university. Even when we were in the secondary schools, they were still Muslim. But when they got to university, they got converted. Uh, Bashiru, one of my good friends, is now Joseph. By the grace of God, praise the Lord. So, well, to cut the story short, Nigeria's 36 states are made of 19 states in the northern part of Nigeria and 17 states in the southern part. But sometimes we use the word northern part to include the middle belt. Some of you have been to Jaws, Plato State, and the middle belt of Nigeria are largely Christians. It's the northern part, northeast and northwest. They are Muslims, maybe even one could say 90 to 95 percent. But the middle belt is largely Christians. That's where you have, all churches are there, but majority of them are, belong to the evangelical, uh, EC, Christ, Equal, yes, I want to, evangelical Christian of West Africa, but they have changed their name recently. Yes, they changed it to all nations, praise. So, there seems to be broad agreement that Muslims constitute slightly larger if you go to the 1963 census, if not equal section of the population than that constituted by Christians. And that there are a substantial number of persons who practice traditional indigenous religious religions as well. It is fair to conclude that Islam and Christianity are the dominant religions in Nigeria. The predominant form of Islam in Nigeria is Sunni even though there are Shia adherents, but very few of them. The Christian faith includes the Roman Catholic Church, the Anglican Communion, Baptist Convention, Seventh-day Adventist, the Methodist Church of Nigeria, the Presbyterian Church of Nigeria, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Church of the Lord, and a large number of evangelical and Pentecostal churches, many of whom are indigenous with no links to the West. Nigeria is a multi-ethnic and multi-religious state. The two major religions in the country, as I've said, are Islam and Christianity. Adher adherents of these two major religions take divergent positions on the questions of the secularity of the Nigerian state. Christians always prefer to say Nigeria is a secular state. But Muslims will tell you Nigeria is a multi-religious state. They don't like to hear that Nigeria is a secular state. They say Nigeria is a multi-religious state. <laughs> the, and then many Muslims in Nigeria appear to seek to be governed by the Sharia in all their human activities. The word Sharia has been defined as the complete universal code of conduct drawn by the creator, Allah, through his messenger, Muhammad. Unto mankind, detailing the religious, political, economic, social, intellectual, and legal systems. So everything is embedded in the Sharia. It is meant for universal application covering the entire spectrum of life, describing what is lawful, which, we, which is called in the Arabic halal, and prohibiting what is unlawful, which is called haram. Some of you heard about Boko Haram. The meaning Boko Haram is, if I will first give you two translations, word for word translation, and then actual meaning. 
Boko is book, haram, forbidden, unlawful. But what it really means is Western education is forbidden. That is what that movement of Boko Haram is all about. They are against Western education. But still, they love books because they want to read Quran and they want to be able to write and read Arabic. Sharia is the Islamic law which is based on the Quran, the Hadith, and the work of scholars in the first two centuries of Islam. The 1999 Constitution of Nigeria did not expressly proclaim Nigeria to be a secular state. However, it prohibits both states and the federal government from adopting any religion. And that is why it is called a multi-religious state. And the Constitution guarantees to every person the right of freedom of thought, conscience, and religions, as well as the right to freedom from discrimination on grounds entirely of religion or background. On the other hand, the Constitution in Chapter 2, under the fundamental objectives and directive principle of state policy, enjoined the state to provide facilities for, among other things, religious life. In addition to that, it makes provision for the establishment of Sharia courts of appeal, though with jurisdiction restricted to questions of Islamic personal law. The Constitution also provides for the taking of oath of office by certain public officers using either the Bible or the Quran. But it did not provide anything for the African traditional religion. The truth of the matter is that most of our politicians don't even really care when they are swearing through the Bible or the Quran. But tell them to come and use one of the symbols of the African traditional religion, they will be scared. Because inside them, they still believe that that one has power and uh, nemesis will catch up with them. One of the symbols of African traditional religion, the religion of Ogun, is iron. So ask any politician in Nigeria to come and swear. Just give him a cutlass. To come and swear by cutlass, he will, he will refuse. Give him Bible or Quran, he will take it gladly because he believes God will not do anything. But the gods, small g, of the African traditional religion is more feared among the people than the God of heaven. Although the constitution is silent on the sources of Nigerian law, Islamic law has been recognized as one of the sources of Nigerian law. These constitutional provisions have been the subject of tendentious interpretations. Why some people contend that the constitution has provided for the secularity of the Nigerian state, others contend to the contrary. Moreover, there is no agreement as to the meaning of secularism. Even the government, at the government level, there have been conflicting pronouncements by ministers of the federal government on the status of Nigeria in terms of relationship of Nigeria state to religion. Recently, the Christian Association of Nigeria urged the, uh, urged the former president, President Goodluck Jonathan, to sanction the Minister of State for Foreign Affairs by name, Mohamed Nuruddin, for allegedly saying publicly that Nigeria is one of the most Christian populated Islamic nations in the world. You just have to read between the lines, hear what he said carefully. <laughs> Nigeria is one of the most Christian populated Islamic nations of the world, which is totally unconstitutional. So the former president of Khan, Pastor Richard Jeffo, further maintained that Section 10 of the Nigerian Constitution affirms the secularity of Nigeria in further reaction to the alleged pronouncement of the Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, the Minister of Foreign Affairs himself, Ambassador Olubenga Shiro, 
said that Nigeria remains a secular state despite its membership in the Organization of Islamic Conference. According to him, the Constitution is very clear that Nigeria is a secular nation. This article will examine the concept of secularity of state in historical perspective. And we will consider the question of whether Nigeria is a secular state having regard to the provisions of the 1999 Constitution of Nigeria as amended. So the, the debate is still ongoing, whether Nigeria ought or ought not to be a secular state is actually outside the scope of this work. Interface and interreligious Africa. Christian and Muslim relationships have been affected historically by Africa's encounter with colonialism and the Western world. Western colonial authorities align themselves with missionaries relying on graduates of their schools to fill positions allotted to the native Africans. The complex Muslim-Christian relationship is linked with the global religious extremism. Narratives of extreme hostility, together with uncommon cooperation, heroism, and even martyrdom, abound all over the world. In the last 20 years, the rise of Islamic militant groups in Africa has shattered Muslim Christian relations. It will interest you to know that because of the problems of these interreligious activities, the NIREC has not met for a whole one year. The last time we met was in 2016, the Nigerian Interreligious Council. And we just received recently, two weeks ago, an invitation because of these Fulani X-Men to meet in February. For a whole one year, we did not have a meeting because the leadership did not know what to say and the Christians were adamant that they would not tolerate further killings. Even then, it was Boko Haram, but then the X-Men started already, not just yesterday, they started killing innocent farmers since about over two years now. It has only become more vigorous, but the killing of farmers by X-Men has been happening over the years. For instance, we have the Al-Shabaab militants headquartered in Somalia. We have the Boko Haram Islamists in Nigeria. And these, all these, and many more, all these have significant influence and proliferation. We have splinter groups from Al-Shabaab, splinter groups from Boko Haram, and so on and so forth. Much of the persecution that Christians in Nigeria face is the result of radical Islamic teaching and activity. Islam is the dominant religion in the north of the country, Nigeria, while Christianity is dominant in the south. Ongoing rivalries between ethnic groups also contribute to the persecution of Christians who are caught in the crossfire. Meanwhile, radical groups such as Boko Haram and Muslim Fulani X-Men heavily persecute believers in the northern and in the Middle Belt regions. The Fulani X-Men have now moved to the southern part of Nigeria to carry out destruction of lives and property. Recently, in the northern part of Nigeria, we have been experiencing the destruction of lives and property orchestrated by the dreaded Islamic terror group Boko Haram. Initially, even before the advent of Boko Haram terror group, Islamic radicals have been killing Christians and setting churches ablaze, which Boko Haram group continue to do till today. So the killing of Christians in the northern part of Nigeria and burning of churches did not start with Boko Haram. There was no Boko Haram in 1992, which was the greatest 
actually problem that we had, religious problem we had in Nigeria, where over 300 pastors were killed in the north, and over 500 churches were born. I don't even think up to today, Boko Haram has been able to achieve that figure of the destruction we experienced in 1992. How, you know, the difference is now you have a group who identify themselves, okay, we are against Christianity. And that's why Boko Haram became so popular. That time in 1992, or even before 1992, there was no group. It's just radical Muslims that were doing it. So there was no group you can mention their name. They don't have a name. They just come together. What really surprised me was a few years back, I don't know, about 12 or 15 years, when there was supposed to be Miss World competition in Nigeria, in Abuja. The moment they saw those girls on TV, on Thursday, the competition was supposed to end Saturday, Sunday. They saw those girls on Thursday. On Friday, they went to the mosque, and the uh, imam preached against it. They just came out from the mosque and started anything they see that resembles Western style. Church is one of them. They take church as representative of the Western world. And then if you dress, like, you know, you suit, like Migusu, <laughs> they just started at attacking people on the street and destroying cars. After hearing the sermon uh, on Friday in, in the mosque, and no, the only thing they were shouting, no, uh, no contest, no uh, Miss World contest, no. And Miss World had to leave Nigeria to London to go and complete the thing. They couldn't complete it in Nigeria because, because of, of the violence. violence. When, when somebody, somebody writes anything here in Europe against Muslims, Christians in Nigeria will suffer for it. Even though the person is not in Nigeria, the person may be from Denmark or Belgium. But, but the Muslims, once, once they get it in the news that, that somebody abused Muhammad in Europe or America, the Nigerian Christians, Christians will suffer for it. They will start burning churches and killing pastors. And, and that, that is the truth. And, and that is what we need to work somehow in our interface, interreligious dialogue. But, but being a member, I can tell you in confidence, there was a meeting we held and, and the next person sitting, sitting to me uh, is a king, king from, from the north. north. And well, well learned. By, by profession, he was a lawyer, lawyer before he became, uh, what did he try to make it to then be emir, before he became an emir of his town. I said, look at what is happening. Why can't you people, you know, you are us because they are emirs and at the same time, the leader of Muslim in their community. Is is a, the setup, setup is different to the Christian setup. Christian setup, setup you are a pastor, pastor, but you are not the king. In, in the southern part of Nigeria, you are not the king of your community. You are not the le necessarily the leader of your community. But, but in their own setup, the emma is always both the leader of the community and the leader of the religious body. Then I ask him, why can't you, all these things that are saying here, why can't you go and tell your people that they should listen to you and their leader and forget whatever any radical imam is saying. He said it's good to talk here in Abuja. He said he cannot repeat. I'm telling you the truth. What he's telling us, he cannot repeat it if he gets back to his community. He said the people in his community will kill him. But he knows that it's wrong. But he does, you know, it's also to some extent helpless. He doesn't know what to do because he has radicals in his community that will not listen. There was a time, we, there was a conflict in Nigeria, the, in the Nadre, the Koshia, the Sultan of Chokoto, and Ayon Shajepo. They both went there to that town where people were afraid to go. They went there and said, you people see us, this is a Christian leader, this is a Muslim leader, stop what you are doing, what you are doing is ungodly. They booed them. Even the Sultan of Chokoto was booed. So you can know the type of thing we are facing. We, we don't need to 
treat this thing with love, you know, we really need to go and think deeply on how to go about it. All the interreligious, we thank God for what the WCC is doing, you know, bringing different things together. Uh, I don't know, Muslim leaders, Jews, uh, called any name, you know, all the different religions all over the world. But uh, it must not stop at the top. I, I, in our Ni Nigerian Interreligious Council, there is no problem at the leader's level. The problem is in the grassroots. The grass, grassroots has been radicalized so much that even they will not listen to their leaders. So if there's anything the World Council of Churches can do about that, you know, because all this gathering is good, we have uh, uh, all sorts of leaders of uh, religious all over the world, we talk together, we, are, we understand ourselves, we agree, we do this, but it's not sinking down to the grassroots. It's not sinking. Because if it was sinking, we would not be having the problem we are having all over the world today. So, the problem we are talking about of Boko Haram, of Al Shabaab, and so on and so forth, is not only common to Nigeria, but also other countries in Africa, including Egypt in particular. Because it has become some sort of way of life now to attack Christians and burn their churches, their places of worship in the Middle East. What is the way forward? Naturally, the way forward is continuous dialogue. Multi-faith dialogue, including Christianity, Islam, and other religions, but particularly in the Nigerian context, including the African traditional religion. For instance, the challenge to Muslim Christian dialogue has in many ways led to the attack of Muslims in the same way that they attack Christians. Some have already come to the, this realization, though these horrific acts are capable of inflaming Christian Muslim sectarianism. We thank God that Nigeria has not got to that level. But if care is not taken, there will be religious war. And religious war will be more devastating than civil war. Because, you know, we all know religion is an opium. When the people now have to fight for their faith, <laughs> there will be no end to it. So when viewed as a common threat, adherence of both Abrahamic faith and the state need to stem the bloodshed by bonding and joining together to fight religious extremism and engage in peace building. WCC has started that in Nigeria with a peace center in Kaduna. Uh, we just want to, you see, you get a lot of reports. I don't know the type of reports because sometimes we are very diplomatic. But the truth of the matter is, I'm sorry, I will say it. This center is to some extent 60% effective because the other partners were not forthcoming. We wanted to engage, we did everything 50-50. We wanted to engage some staff for the center in Kaduna, for example. Told the Muslims counterparts, the Christians, okay, you advertise for the position. The Christians already got a staff. Did I, as I'm speaking, the Muslims are here to bring their candidates to the center who will be working with their Christian colleagues. So I don't really know <laughs> what we can do. This is a paid office, and it's so difficult. And I think the difficulty is in working with a Christian. I don't know whether it's against their norm, even though they will not tell you that. But the reality is they will not give you anybody and there are so many people looking for jobs in the north. So it's not that they don't have. It's social work. 
And many of them studied also sociology and all the rest of them. So please, in your engagement with the prince and other people that have something to say, the people need to be talked to. They just have to change their concept. Without tolerance and understanding for others, Christians alike must have understanding for, the, for Islam. It's part of human rights. You can worship any god you want. You can take to any religion you want. Religion must not, you know, we must be able to influence the leaders of all religions, Islam in particular, that when somebody is open, open secret to Nigeria, if you change as a Muslim in northern part of Nigeria and you, you become a Christian, it's a death warrant, a papa or whatever they call it. Any Muslim has right to kill you for changing your religion. So, you know, what are we discussing with these Muslim leaders? These are the areas we should discuss with them to tell their people there must be freedom of religion, freedom of worship. The way we have churches, because you'll be, you'll be surprised that we have churches in the northern part of Nigeria, we have to be very creative to even have churches in the northern part of Nigeria because no state governor will sell land to you. I'm almost finished. No state governor will send land to you in Nigeria. But still, we still have churches. What do we do? You go and buy, the, your church will give you money. You buy the land from a private person. And you now write, after you buy it, you will write it that you give it to the church. That's only how you can get land to build churches in the northern part of Nigeria. We need, you know, all these things. And Muslims don't have problem in building mosques in the southern part of Nigeria because we tolerate one another. Even in the southwest, all what we are looking for, uh, uh, coexistence and all the rest of them, is being practiced in the southwest of Nigeria. In the southwest of Nigeria, you can only find a family where there is no Christian. <laughs> and even some Muslims in the southwest of Nigeria are so tolerant. And they are leaders of Islam. They have, Christ they have some of their children who are pastors. They don't throw them away and they don't kill them, but the other way around, it cannot happen. If that happens, there's a bad power on you. So, freedom is, should be actually the bedrock of our discussion with some other head of religions. Freedom, as we have said earlier, may be defined as the condition of not being controlled by another person, nation, political power, religion, or restricted by a dogma or oppressive power. Therefore, there must be freedom of religion, human rights, which is also embraced association and speech. These are funda fundamental human rights that must be respected by every society, nation, and country irrespective of one faith, belief, or religion. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you so much, uh, Your Holiness, for this uh, quite comprehensive uh, description of the realities as you experience them and as you see them in your country. I think this is... Uh, important subject for us to, to discuss, and we have asked uh, several people here, as you see, to give their comments and their response to this. Uh, first is um, the WCC Deputy General Secretary, Professor Dr. Isabel Apavov. Thank you. His Holiness, um, our General Secretary, staff of the WCC, LWF, and the, the sister organizations, and sisters and brothers. And first, I want to thank you very much for being a leader of a church that truly defines what African Christianity is all about in its outlook, form, and scope. While the missiologists have classified your church as founded in Africa by Africans for Africans, your church has gone beyond the boundaries of the African continent in its 
reach and membership. Your church is rooted in vibrant and relevant African spirituality, which is informed by the Bible and is shared with enthusiasm in the ecumenical circles in Nigeria, in, the Afri in all Africa Conference of Churches and also in the World Council of Churches. It is no wonder then that your brand of Christianity is growing rapidly. Second, the context of Nigeria is showing us that despite our vibrant and relevant spirituality, there is a problem of uh, religious extremism, as you described it, which is fueling what is um, described as religious uh, motivated violence. Hearing the stories of the Christians and the Muslims during our February 2017 pilgrimage of justice and peace in Abuja and Kaduna, it became clear that inequalities and corruption are, contribu are contributing to what is described as religiously motivated violence. At the same time, we saw the importance of you know, Christian Muslim religious leaders working together to prevent crimes and uh, atrocities committed in the name of religion. So uh, for me, when I look at Nigeria and think of uh, what can be done to make sure that you know, there's peace education and that uh, people are not just thinking of themselves as Christians and Muslims, but they're thinking of themselves as Nigerians, because for a very long time, Christianity and Islam coexisted peacefully. So we need to ask ourselves, what is wrong in the way we are defining our identity, you know, that is now bringing this violence, you know, from a religious perspective? And lastly, in the 2017 report of the reference group on the pilgrimage of justice and peace, it states that the peace building requires more than talking about peace. It demands committed workers who understand that a peaceful country is not necessarily one free of conflict, but one that is able to manage conflict constructively. So as we think of the pilgrimage of justice and peace, uh, we learn that peace should go hand in hand with justice and it's justice for all God's people and creation. So I'm interested you know, to know uh, how your church is actually promoting justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Isabel. Uh, we collect our comments and we will give you the chance uh, at the end to comment on, the, on this. Uh, we continue with Professor Dr. Christoph Strickelberger, the founder of GlobethicsNet Foundation and also the executive director of Geneva Agape Foundation and a neighbor here in the house. Please, Christoph. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this invitation, Your Holiness, and all present three minutes, three comments. <laughs> Maybe I, I first say my relation to Nigeria in Globethic Net, we have, uh, I think, about 7,000 or more Nigerians already in the Globethic Net as registered participants. So we feel that uh, this global community is close to us. Uh, I was also appointed uh, this year as a chair for global ethics in uh, the Catholic University of Enugu, Nigeria which is uh, maybe also a little testimonial uh, for ecumenism as a reformed pastor to teach in a Catholic university in a multi-faith context. My first remark is on um, identity. In my last course in this university, I asked about, it was on ethics, what you as students, about 40 uh, master students, whom would you elect as a Nigerian president? If you have a woman, a Christian, a Muslim, somebody from your ethnic group, uh, the Ibu, um, um, and 95% uh, all of, except one, 
said, of course, we give priority to our ethnic group, which was not so much a surprise, but it shows that, in fact, uh, not the religion was counted, not the gender was counted, but the ethnic my, uh, identity. So the answer for me would be, if we say Christian identity across denominations, we would say Jesus first and not my ethnic group first. But uh, the reality, and I think in other countries, including my own, it is not so that the Jesus first is always le uh, living. It's the ethnic in Switzerland, we would say the cantonal identity is stronger than our denominational one. Second point, in Nigeria, I see a lot of emphasis on miracles, which also challenges my faith. As a uh, Swiss reformed theologian, I'm more rational than uh, uh, giving priority to miracles. But I see the difference in culture, as uh, in the Bible we see uh, the Jewish who uh, believed a lot or wanted to see miracles, whereas the Greeks said, no, no, miracles is not my, my business. I uh, uh, don't believe in miracles. Um, so how to, to deal with this uh, different cultural expression of Christian faith and also multi-faith? And uh, my uh, conclusion is we need very strong, deep, profound good theologies. Theology matters, and that's why theological training, I think, matters also as a contribution to peace, because there's a lot of abuse in all countries with faith, and uh, that's why I hope that, uh, and I'm sure also such a center for interfaith dialogue has to do its homework, so to say, in the form of the, uh, good theology. Um, the third is action. Ethics is my own uh, business. I see a, a huge potential in Nigeria with the entrepreneurial spirit I see in so many uh, uh, Nigerians. Now that is even visible in faith. Uh, many Christians, also Muslim, run their faith like a business. That has a positive side, but also, of course, negative side as we see. So how to use this entrepreneurial spirit in favor of an entrepreneurial approach of coming together? I put it more as a question than an answer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think we, we have many important perspectives on this, uh, on this conversation. We continue with... Um, uh, our colleague Jennifer Kilpotnissen, the WCC Program Executive for Human Rights. You have also three minutes. Okay, I'll try to be brief. Uh, thank you very much and thank you, Your Holiness, for bringing your delegation and uh, being with us at this time. Um, I've been invited to speak because I was in Nigeria just a couple of months ago. I did a series of human rights workshops co-hosted with our brother Adebayo, who I see has just stepped out at the moment, but without him the workshops would not have been uh, as, as successful as they were. The background to these workshops, um, about, I think, April last year, we had a student here from Nigeria studying at uh, the Bossi Institute. She's um, a Methodist deaconess um, who's normally um, working in a boarding school in Lagos. And she was expressing her concern about the number of teenage girls coming to her, confiding in her about sexual, sex abuse and violence that was happening in their own homes. Um, they felt too shamed to speak out about it. If they did speak out about it, they weren't believed. They might even be blamed for somehow instig instigating the abuse, and this, there was no legal remedy for them. Now, I should stress this is not a Nigerian problem. This is a global prop problem, one that doesn't respect boundaries. But what we were hearing is that churches in Nigeria want to address this. They want to become safe places, places where victims will come and be believed and get some support. And that's something that we don't always see. So then the question was, what sort of opportunities do we have on the international level to uh, raise awareness of this situation, to push the Nigerian government to address this issue, and to let children be heard, which are all very important aspects of our uh, current uh, Church's Commitments to Children project. We looked on the 
UN reporting um, schedule and saw that Nigeria is due to report to the Human Rights Council in November of this year. So the timing was, was perfect. We went to Nigeria in, in November and carried out a series of workshops in Benui, Jos and Ibadan with children, um, hearing what they had to say with adults. Uh, it was multi-faith uh, participants, people with disabilities came and we designed the workshops to allow um, the participant to raise whatever concerns they wanted to about their, their human rights. The workshops demonstrated how critical it is to listen to children because when we collected all the feedback, what the children were saying was not necessarily the same as what the adults were saying. Um, our rep final report on this will be sent to the UN in March and we can certainly share it with anybody that's, uh, that's, that's here that's interested in seeing it. But just a few key points. Children were overwhelmingly telling us about their access to education, which came up in a meeting this morning. Um, very little access to quality education. Uh, it was a massive concern, coupled with non-payment of salaries. Teachers hadn't been paid since January of last year, and this was November. So that, in turn, leads to children then going into to work, labouring in farms, working in as domestic um, servants, or selling items on the streets, which then uh, exposes them to all sorts of vulnerabilities, um, including trafficking and just the general lack of un unemployment opportunities. Women were talking to us about the discrimination they felt in pretty much all areas of their life, high levels of violence against women, um, rights against widows such as being disinherited from um, their, their land when their husband died and their, pro their, their hus the property going back to their husband's uh, family. Um, men agreed with this and said that, and both men and women were saying that sometimes it's women also perpetrating the discrimination against women, so it's cultural issues that needed to be addressed. So just, just three final impressions. Um, the, the enormity of the Fulani problem, I don't think I was aware of quite how serious that was until I went, but it, but it struck me at how little this is known outside Nigeria. We hear a lot about Boko Haram. We do not hear much about Fulani. Um, the issues of the, the vast inequalities, we saw great wealth in Nigeria, but also great, great poverty. And I have to just say a final thing. I've been to many countries, but the welcome and the warmth that you gave me was, um, was, was really about the best I've had, so thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer, for also showing uh, very recent initiatives and also other dimensions to this issue and how we are involved as a WCC. The next speaker is uh, Reverend Professor Dr. Dietrich Werner, a former colleague and still a good friend, senior advisor now for theology, ecumenical education and research at uh, Bread for the World in the German uh, context. Thank you so much, Olaf. Having known His Excellency Dr. Rufus Ositelo for quite some years, I cannot hide that I have always admired the comprehensive and integral nature of the ecclesial self-understanding which your church represents. And I refer in this to the six tenets which several of you might have heard of, that your church understands itself being biblical in pattern, ecumenical in outlook, evangelical in mission, Pentecostal in power, prophetic in ministry, and social in responsibility. I do not know how to formulate this <laughs> more comprehensively. And this actually means something for me, because to a certain extent, I think you bring together in your church tradition all the three streams of the ecumenical movement, the passion for unity, the passion for social service and justice, and the passion for mission. You don't allow your church tradition to be just put in one box over against the other. So to be either politically concerned or pious, either Pentecostal or evangelical, either ecumenical or whatever. So you try to hold things together within African culture and tradition. And I think this is extremely important because it is not less religion which can counter radicalized and instrumentalized extremist religion. It is more religion, but it is more enlightened and reflected religion. It is more Christianity, which is embedded in the six tenets as the six learning movements which your church understands itself to be apart from. Your church also is 
Alla Dura churches, that is the essence of it, a praying movement. And that means your church represents a spirit of expectancy, of hope, and of resilience. And I always tell colleagues in our organization, Bread for the World, National Protestant Development Agency, development actually, dear friends, does not start with project management, with transfer of funds, <coughs> with description of impact monetaries. Development actually starts with a rediscovery of human dignity and a change of mentality. Transforming our world today towards Sustainable Development Agenda 2013. Remember that the heading of the SDG agenda is about transforming our world today. Your church brings the message, no social and political transformation today without spiritual transformation, without religious transformation, without a change of mentality, the change of mindset, a spiritual revolution and the understanding of the dignity of all human beings is at the heart of the issue. There is no development context uh, concept without an integral component of spiritual renewal. That is a learning lesson also for some ecumenical agencies. But you don't stop just with spiritual formation. Your church, if I know correctly, has embarked in a major process to actually do development to do empowerment for women, for girls, for youth, for young people. The Justice, Equity, Peace and Empowerment Foundation, JEPEF, is one social service wing which you have set up. And if I read in some of the key components, and it is quite remarkable that your church is engaged both in climate change projects, in issues of food security, in issues of combating corruption, in issues of human rights, issues of good governance, issues of capacity building, and also female and youth empowerment. So quite a comprehensive outlook in this. Just to share one little experience from our own organization, Bread for the World currently is involved in a research and dialogue process with African Institute and Pentecostal churches to explore broader areas of mutual learning and understanding. This does not mean that we do not respect the autonomy and the self-determination of African Institute churches because that is part of what is forming your essence and your identity and we fully respect this. But this is to explore whether we might need a different model and pattern of relationships, not classical project management relationships, but learning partnerships, relationships. Because there is so much which we can learn from each other. There is more than a hundred years of history of ecumenical social ethics to deepen the understanding of ethics of policy, ethics of family, ethics of business, ethics of invent investment, environmental ethics. Much in this we can learn together and we have to develop new instruments of deepening learning partnerships with African Institute churches, Western classical development agencies more or less have been engaged with traditional mainline churches, which grew out of the world missionary movement, for sure. But there is a changing landscape of African Christianity, both in West Africa, East Africa, and also in Southern Africa. And in this learning process, which is still going on, we are trying to sit together with colleagues from Pentecostal, from African Institute, charismatic and newly independent churches to learn how we can actually assist each other in a learning process to contribute to mentality change, value change, spiritual change, but also to real improvement in terms of capacity building for empowerment for young girls, for women, for education, to do education in a proper way which is contributing to human dignity on the African continent. Thanks for your contribution. You are a bridge building church in the African 
continent, and we hope that you are playing this role also in future in other parts of the African continent. Thank you, uh, Dietrich, for this uh, perspective and uh, sharing some of your long, long experience and also long relationship with with uh, with uh, our church visiting here. Then we have another <coughs> type of response from uh, remark or remark from Dr. Ani Gazarian Grisi, the WCC program executive for the Commission on Faith and Order. Please, <coughs> Your Holiness, thank you very much for your message. And coming from the Faith and Order uh, Commission Secretariat, I will be more maybe with the theological in my question. So today we live in a multicultural and multi-faith society and a diversity that is both enriching and challenging. Religious and cultural tradition can be used to justify intolerance, discrimination and violence and can give also to rise a, a lake of understanding of rejection. But equally they can nurture a sense of meaning strengthen identity, bring people together, motivate them to work for justice and promote peace. The message of the Bible clearly calls Christian in following the example of Jesus to stand up for foreigners and minorities, to promote nonviolence, justice and peace, and to show respect and love towards all human beings. Christians are recalled by Jesus himself to speak positively about those who were foreign or others in relation to his listeners. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 8, verses 11, we read, I tell you, many will come from east and west and sit at table with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Christians are called to seek to encounter and dialogue with people of other faith and to do their greatest to ensure that every member of our society is free to live out and practice their faith. In this way, Christians acknowledge religious freedom as one of the fundamental dimensions of human dignity and in the charity called for by Christ himself, Christ, Christ himself and they seek to respect that dignity and to dialogue with others, not only to share the riches of Christian faith, but also to appreciate whatever element of truth and goodness are present in other religions. However, within the contemporary context of increased awareness of religious pluralism, the possibility of salvation for those who do not explicitly believe in Christ and the relation between interreligious dialogue and the proclamation that Jesus is Lord have increasingly become topics of reflection and discussion among Christians. There remain disagreement within and between some churches concerning these issues. The New Testament teaches that God wills the salvation of all people and at the same time that Jesus is the one and only savior of the world. What conclusion may be drawn from these biblical teachings regarding the possibility of salvation for those who do not believe in Christ, as this is the context in Nigeria? Some hold that in ways known to God, salvation in Christ through the power of Holy Spirit is possible for those who do not explicitly share Christian faith. Others do not see how such a view sufficiently corresponds to biblical passage about the necessity of faith and baptism for salvation. Differences on this question will have an impact upon how one understands and put into practice the mission of the church. Within today's context of increased awareness of the vitality of various religions throughout the world, a question remains to all of us. How may the churches, and especially in Nigeria, arrive at greater convergence about this issue and co cooperate more effectively in witnessing to the gospel in word and action? Thank you. Well, you get uh, not only small questions <laughs> to deal with, <laughs> but we have another uh, remark from our colleague, um, Reverend Dr. Benjamin. Simon, the professor of ecumenical missiology at the Ecumenical Institute of Bosse, who is also an old friend and one who knows the, the church well. Please. Thank you, dear General Secretary, your eminence, dear Rufus, dear delegation members, dear colleagues, brothers and sisters. Um, after this large variety of different aspects about the Church of the Lord, Aladura worldwide, 
it's quite difficult. I want to focus on one point which was maybe not yet focused, but the one who is connecting the two of us since more than 20 years now, when we met the first time 1997, 1998 in Leeds at the first conference for African Christian diaspora. At that time, your eminence, you were uh, a pastor in a congregation near Frankfurt. I was doing my research uh, at that time about African Christianity in Europe. And um, so th the two of us met 20 years, more than 20 years ago. And I want to stress on this fact because the Church of the Lord Aladura is really a fantastic example about what we call today world Christianity. World Christianity with its multi-centricity, with many different spaces where it is active, where um, the church is at home, and this example of an African-initiated church is really a wonderful one if you want to talk about world Christianity, because you can find the Church of the Lord Aladura nearly all over the world in the meantime, and um, this is amazing. In Europe, in the US, I think in Asia, in the meantime, there are some congregations of the Church of the Lord Aladura. And it is important to stress on this issue because those congregations in Frankfurt, in London, in New York, in different places all over the world are playing a very important role in that very society where they are based. They are established out of reasons, uh, diverse reasons. Students are going abroad. There are marriages taking place or migration of different types are bringing the people together in that very city. But all in all, it's important to know that those congregations are giving a home away from home. They offer a new shelter and sometimes they play also a new role or the people of those congregations play a new role. That's why I called my, one of my books From Migrants to Missionaries. They become missionaries in that new context and some people talk also about mission in reverse also in your book. You were using this uh, uh, term used in the, in, the, in the whole topic. Those congregations offer, on the one hand, a new home. On the other side, they are uh, very often dealing with a theology of Exodus, and therefore the members are in the promised land, so they're giving them new hope. And this is a fantastic issue, an important theological aspect and work that they, those churches are doing. They are uh, identity-building those congregations and they are re important resource people for established churches in that very context, especially also in our topic now about interreligious dialogue because Nigerians, being with your example, they know about what it means living together with people of other faith. They give legal assistance to their members, they offer job opportunities, they establish new ecumenical relationships, not flying away six, eight hours, ten hours to other churches, but they are here, they are sharing the congregational hall and the church buildings. So here a new way of ecumenism takes place directly, not in front of our doors, but in our doors, which is amazing. And we share the life together and there's possibility of learning from each other right in the midst of our, our own societies. In the mission document Together Towards Life, which will be at the base of our World Mission Conference in March in Arusha, it says, a plurality of cultures is a gift of the spirit to deepen our understanding of our faith and one another. To finish, to summarize, I think your church is really a wonderful example to show in how far world Christianity is helping people to integrate and in certain contexts and to show how um, churches can also be a contributor to certain contexts in which they are based. Thank you. Thank you. I think this uh, shows uh, an interest both in Christianity and in human rights and in multi-faith and in Nigeria and in all these combinations. 
Uh, we'll give you five minutes to, to give a, a response. Uh, we cannot um, share everything we think about this, but uh, it is very interesting to hear how you respond to these comments from, from our panelists. Five minutes means uh, eight minutes. And after that, we will um, open the floor for uh, five minutes before we conclude. Thank you. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank all those who contributed uh, to this uh, topic and uh, your contributions has, uh, have been very encouraging. Um, really, it's not by design or because we are better or anything. It is just right from the beginning, the founder of this church was listening to God for directives for all that he was supposed to do. Most of the things the WCC is working on today, yesterday and today, are things that we have been practicing in our church long, right from the beginning. It's not even a long time. Right from the beginning. He said God called him and said he should bring both women and men into the ministry, into the pastoral ministry. Right from the beginning. So it's not something, you know, after our discussion, we had something and we now started changing. It has been right. We have women pastors. We have women cardinals. We have women archbishops. And it's not a new <laughs> innovation. It has been there from the beginning. To God be the glory. <laughs> so let me quickly, I have three more minutes. <laughs> um, how is the church promoting peaceful coexistence? Uh, well, I just want to thank uh, Dietrich. He mentioned it. He showed you a pamphlet. Do you still have that pamphlet? Let me, okay. Uh, if you, we, we have some copies with us. It's free. If you are interested, you can get one. This is an NGO of the church. You know, as a church, when we start, because we love peaceful coexistence, we want peace between all religions, even African traditional religions. But if you invite them to a meeting as a church, some of them will stay back. They don't want to have anything to do with church. So we now came up with an NGO. With this NGO, we have even the leader of the Muslims in our community is part of it. So the traditional religion also is part of it. With the NGO, it's easy to bring all religions together. We discuss about actually the most important thing, peaceful coexistence, and how we can now empower women and youth. Mm -hmm. And then we dive into other areas like uh, uh, climate change and you know, uh, burning nuclear weapon all over the world and some other social issues. So this is what we've been doing and uh, it, has been, it has been going well till now and we give God the glory. Um, how will, or what will happen to those who love God but are not Christians? If I can rephrase your question, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the scriptures also speak about it. And uh, many, even who became Christians later, said the time unknown, the time when we did not know the right thing, but the love of God has been there. They even they did a lot of havoc, thinking they were defending God, you know, killing other people. Even Paul, who was Saul, was there, uh, seeing his colleagues stoning uh, people who are followers of Christ. I think the most fundamental thing is, if you have not heard about Christ, if you don't know the Savior, but adventure because of the seed God has sown into everyone, has planted into every one of us and you are doing the will of God. I believe that you'll be saved. I believe you'll be saved if you are doing the will of God without even reading it in the book because there is nobody you can, you know, I think this has been tested even by scientists. There is nobody who does not know 
good from bad. God has not created anybody who cannot differentiate between good and bad. So we all know what is good. We all know what is bad. If some people now, per adventure, like Saul, who, uh, who are Muslims today, for example, it could be any, any other religion. It could even be Christians who are killing people of other religions by thinking they are fighting for God. Don't let us make mistakes. These people are not crazy. They are doing it thinking they are defending God, their own God. And, uh, you know, if I'm not mistaken, the same God. It's only just like uh, Paul told the Greeks. This same God, is the same God you want to pray to through the, sun, the God of sun, the God of water. You know, but with Jesus Christ, you can now call on him directly. So, all we need to do is, if you want even to share the word of God, let us do everything in love. Not by condemning. By saying, oh, you're blind. You don't know anything. Or whatever. We must watch the type of language we use. Use the type of language Paul used. Oh, it's the same God. You know, you will see the difference. You can call on this person. Uh, there's no more barrier between you. You can call directly on him. You don't need to uh, worship uh, the, the, the God of sun or the God of moon or the God of water or river or whatever. So, in a nutshell, I think the question has been answered not to take too much of your time. Normally, if we have another session, one could elaborate on this. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is a very interesting uh, interaction. There should be an opportunity also for the floor to ask questions. You have two minutes to <laughs> announce your interest. <laughs> One minute to ask. But uh, <laughs> the floor is open. Please use one of these microphones. Please uh, speak to the microphone. Yeah, yeah, please. But go, go to the microphone. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate the lecture given, but I want to be more educated as a person. In your speech, sir, you intimated us that leaders of Muslim, that they are not the problem. Rather, those are the grassroots. I want to be educated because when you look at these leaders, many a time they are the same people that preach to their supporter. Mm -hmm. And out of their preaching, their supporters at the grassroots came to injure people. So are they really sincere mm -hmm. with what they say when they sit down with you at meetings? Thank you, sir. Okay. Can I? Thank you. Um, I think we are mixing certain things up. The imams who are leading uh, a mosque are not necessarily the leader of Islam in the community. They may be, they are just like a pastor. The leader of Islam is the emir. It's just like the Sultan of Chokoto is the leader of all Muslims in Nigeria and even some parts of northern uh, Nigeria, uh, you know, uh, other countries, uh, Niger, Chad, uh, Northern Cameroon, the sort of Chokro is their leader. So, but if a local um, imam now can say something which the Sultan does not believe in, the imam is closer to the grassroots, he's a grassroots man. So that's why I use the word grassroots and the leaders. The leaders actually are the emirs and the, you know, the king in, in English. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, Your Holiness, it's a privilege for me to be here as a lay person and a person who runs a company called SEEDS, which is an acronym for Social Entrepreneurship and Enterprise Development Strategies. In Nigeria, some 70% of the people of working age are in vulnerable situation or unemployed. 95% of the college graduates are unemployed or, or doing things that are not up to their level. I was just wondering, how can the church be a vector for creating 
um, jobs, for creating wealth, especially at the grassroots, because the grassroots get r uh, radicalized due to the fact they have nothing to do. And so they are at the mercy of any uh, good news that's coming by. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The church are actually working on this as far as the youth, Christian youth are concerned. They are working with many international organizations. But um, I think the major problem is the Muslim youth. Because when Boko Haram started in Nigeria, and we discussed it at the higher level, NIREC, uh, Nigeria Interreligious Council, the answer that we got was that uh, the youth, Muslim youth, worse than the Christian youth, have no job. Even many of them did not go to school. Many, many who went to school did not finish. They did not even finish secondary school, not to talk of universities. If you go to the north today, till today, in the past it was different. Europeans were teaching in all the institutions in the north. But today, uh, the southern intellectuals have replaced the whites, the Europeans. So very few of them go to school. If you've been to the north, you have been to the north. You, if you go to any petrol station just to uh, fill your car, you see a lot of youth, young children, between the age of six and maybe 18, carrying bowls in their hand, begging. At the time, they should be in school. So Nigeria is actually sitting on a bomb, gunpowder, because large number, about 97% of the youth in the north don't go to school. Instead of going to school, they all go to al Majari school where they learn Quran. And when you finish, you know, when you finish learning Quran, what work are you going to do? Nobody can employ you. Only a few of you will be employed as imam. They don't have so many mosques, millions of mosques, where they, all these people. So the, now the orientation, what the federal government is doing, is that they want now to introduce to all those Islamic schools where they only learn how to read Quran, how also to do arithmetic, you know, subtraction, of, and many other few subjects that normally people do in the school, they want to introduce it to them so that things can change little. But you cannot take them to school by force. They won't go. The parents will not even allow them to go because the parents also don't have anything to eat. They don't have jobs. So they send these children out during the day to go and beg and bring home either money or food. Thank you very much. My own is not a question. It's just a comment. I am a living example of a Muslim changed to a Christian. I'm from a Muslim family, but today I'm a reverend of the Church of the Lord, the Lord Ruler Worldwide. I give thanks to God for this. I was trying to ruminate over the peace building early this morning. I went through portions of the, the book of Philippians, Philippians, John and James. At the end of my reading this morning, I was made to know that love and prayer, the two are answers to the prob continual problems facing us all over the world. This morning, I listened carefully that WCC has a date for prayer all over the world last year. I want to say that the Church of the Lord Ladura has four days in a year whereby we be in the church from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. a day with our Lord to pray and pray and pray. Because despite all our discussions, dialogue every day, terrorism, conflict, is they are on the throne. I am now encouraged the more that the Church of the Ladura is doing the right thing. If we are doing this four times in a year, whereby we pray all over the day, I'm of the view that if WCC could intensify this 
idea of one day in a year all over the world for prayer is a way forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I would like to give a comment to the last comment uh, to wind up our reflections, actually. Um, the World Council of Churches is calling for many days of prayer during the year. Last week, we had the week of prayer for Christian unity. In uh, February, we will, together with other people of faith, uh, call for uh, prayer in the inter week of interfaith harmony, which is actually an initiative under the UN. We sometimes call for special days of prayer, like we did also last year, um, prayer against famine. We have the prayers for peace. We have the day of prayer for children. We have um, to say, we have also um, a long history, but also new initiatives of how we can call our community together in prayer. And many of the concerns we have in our prayers is those we have heard about this afternoon. How can we help people to find their dignity and their human rights in Nigeria, but also in other parts of the world, so that we are able to live together? with justice and, and in peace. I heard also one important message among many, and that is that human rights are many, but maybe the most basic human rights for many people today is the right to education. And that is not an individual right only to the individual child, but to the whole community and the nation, and even beyond that. Education is a gift that we can hand over from one generation to another, and it is also a human right. Among many other human rights issues mentioned this afternoon, I think we should also keep that in mind. How can we contribute to that right be fulfilled? But we have um, used our time. There is a program that continues for you and for others here. So um, I thank you all. I thank you for this uh, opportunity to get deeper into the, uh, to the context of Nigeria and to also to the life of your church, both from yourself and also from our colleagues here. Uh, it was very, very uh, interesting and also very inspiring to hear how you try to fulfill the call we share together. So let us continue also the work for human rights, multi-faith relationships, both in work and in prayer. Thank you so much. The ecumenical tea has been expanded also to ecumenical coffee, uh, and it should be served here in the, in the cafeteria.